Hello. Today we're going to talk about uniform circular motion. So our goals for today, our first one is to first talk about circular motion and then we'll talk about the special case of uniform circular motion and that is circular motion with constant speed. And our second goal is to look at the basic equation and this is specifically an equation for the acceleration uh, when there is uniform circular motion going on. Okay, so speaking of acceleration, here is an object going in a circle at constant speed. So if the speed is constant, is there an acceleration? So spend a couple of seconds, think about that. So, well, let's go back to what acceleration is, right? Acceleration is the rate of change, time rate of change of velocity. And velocity, of course, has two pieces that make it up. It's got the magnitude, and the magnitude is not changing here. But the other piece that goes into velocity is the direction, and the direction continually changes as the object, the direction of the velocity continually changes as the object moves around the circle. So if you have a change in either one of the things that make a velocity, direction or magnitude, then the velocity changes and there's an acceleration. So circular motion fits that scenario. Even though the magnitude of the velocity is constant, the direction is changing, so there is an acceleration. So now we're going to figure out what the acceleration depends on. So we know if we go back to our definition of acceleration, acceleration we can write as change in velocity over the time interval during which the change in velocity occurred. So we'll take an object going around a circle and we'll do some little vector construction here. So what are we up to? Well at the bottom of the circle you see three colored points. One's green, one's black, and then one is uh, kind of purple. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the acceleration at the very bottom of the circle where the black point is. Okay, so we'll consider a time interval during which the object moves from the green point to the purple point. So we look at our initial velocity. That's the velocity of the object at the green point. So that's uh, indicated by the length of that green arrow. And then the final velocity at the end of our time interval is the velocity of the object at the purple point. So that's indicated by the purple vector. The purple vector and the green vector of the same length because the speed is constant, but they have different directions. So the velocity is always tangent to the circle. Okay, so now we have a black arrow connecting the tips of these two vectors. Well, where is that coming from? So what we have is the initial velocity there in green, the final velocity there in purple, and so the initial velocity plus the change in velocity gives you the final velocity. So that black vector represents the change in velocity. You note that the change in velocity is directed toward the center of the circle, and so that must be also the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so we'll call this change in velocity delta v1, and our time interval delta t1, and so this will be acceleration 1. Then we'll do a few different scenarios, which is why we've got our 1 here, and then we'll do 2 and 3, etc. Okay, so one thing to note, however, is that the direction of delta v, and therefore the direction of the acceleration, is toward the center of the circle. And if we did this little construction with the triangle and the vectors at any other point on the circle, we would also find the acceleration is in toward the center of the circle. Okay, so now we know for uniform circular motion, the acceleration, there is an acceleration, and it is directed toward the center of the circle. Okay, so let's go from there and figure out, well, what this acceleration depends on. So we'll investigate the speed dependence. Okay, so once again, in general, we have our acceleration is determined by change in velocity over the time interval during which the change in velocity occurs. So now we double the speed, and we'll do our same vector construction. Okay, so we've got the same size circle. We've got the same points we considered before but the object is going twice as fast and so the velocity vectors are twice as big. So this triangle here is scaled up by a factor of two from the one on the previous screen. Okay, so there's our initial velocity. The velocity 
of the object as it passes through the green point. The final velocity is the uh, purple vector, the velocity of the, object, of the object when it passes through the purple point. And then we've got a change in velocity, which we'll call delta v2 in this case. And all those vectors are twice as big as the vectors on the previous screen, the corresponding vectors on the previous screen, because we have doubled the speed. Okay, so if we double the speed, that means we double the acceleration, or what? Well, delta v is doubled, but we've also messed around with delta t, right? Because delta t is the time it takes the red object to move from the green point to the purple point. These two objects, these two points, are the same distance apart they were before, but the object is going twice as fast, and so it only takes half as long. Okay, so we've doubled delta v, and we've halved delta t. So that gives us an overall factor of 4. Our new acceleration is 4 times bigger than the old acceleration. Okay, and if we triple the speed, what we'd find is the acceleration is nine times bigger than the original acceleration, etc. So in general, what happens is the acceleration goes as v squared. Double v acceleration increases by a factor of four, that is two squared. Okay, so acceleration proportional to v squared. How about what happens if we mess around with the radius? Okay, so we're going to keep the speed the same but the radius is smaller and our green and purple points are at the same angles that they were before. So it turns out that they're half the distance apart as they were before. Okay, so we get exactly the same um, triangle here as we did originally. Okay, so this is VI and VF, delta V3. Delta V3 is the same as delta V1. Okay, so delta V is the same as it was originally. But delta t is half as big because even though the speed is the same, the distance between our green and purple points is half as large as it was originally. And so our acceleration is double what it was originally. Okay, delta v3 and delta v1 are the same. Delta t3, our new time interval here, is only half as large as the original one. That gives us overall a factor of 2 that the acceleration is larger than it was originally. Okay, so when we reduce the radius by a factor of 2, the acceleration actually goes up by a factor of 2. So these guys are inversely related. The acceleration turns out to be inversely proportional to r, the radius. Okay, so now we're at the point where we can write down an equation for what we call the centripetal acceleration. The acceleration directed in toward the center of the circle whenever an object is going in a circular path. So this centripetal acceleration is directed toward the center of the circle, and if it's uniform circular motion, motion in a circle at constant speed, this is the only acceleration there is. So you note there's two vectors on this uh, animation of the object going around the circle. The purple one is the acceleration, that's the one directed to the center, and the blue one is the velocity. Okay, so the magnitude of our acceleration is, in fact, v squared over r proportional to v squared, inversely proportional to the radius, distance from the center, and that's it. No factors of pi or 2 or anything else. So v squared over r. So, again, this is the very special form that the acceleration has when an object is experiencing circular motion, uniform circular motion in particular. That's the only acceleration there is. Okay, so Here's some other things we can talk about for uniform circular motion. Well, the path is obviously a circle. We characterize a circle by a radius, r, and a circumference, distance once around the circle, which is 2 pi r. Uniform, again, means motion at constant speed. That speed happens to be distance over time. If we do the distance, the full distance once around, that's 2 pi r. And capital T here represents what we call the period, and the period is the time to go once around the circle. <clears throat> Our angle we can measure in radians. If we measure it in radians, then we take 
the distance the object travels along the circular arc divided by the radius. That's the angle in radians. Note that uh, really that has no units. It's a length over a length. Okay, so if we have two different circles here with the same angle for them, then um, that really should that triangle really should go, the vertex of that triangle should really be at the center, common center of those two circles. Not sure why it's not. Anyway, so delta theta is the same for those two circles. Okay, different R's and correspondingly different arc lengths, delta S's. Okay, so in this case, the length over length happens to be dimensionless, but we usually give the angle the unit of radian. And you can convert to uh, degrees if you want. Remember that 180 degrees is the same as pi radians. Okay, so we start talking about something we call angular velocity. So angular velocity, our symbol looks a little bit like a W, but it is in fact the Greek letter omega. And the angular velocity is related to angle the same way that the regular velocity is related to position. It's the time rate of change of position, that's what velocity is. Angular velocity is the time rate of change of angular position. So these two objects in the animation happen to be experiencing exactly the same angular velocity. Their speeds are different. Okay, The green one is traveling much further than the red one in the same amount of time, so it has to go faster but the rate at which they're sweeping out angles is the same. Okay, So the speed, remember, is 2 pi r over t or 2 pi over t r. And, well, look at that. 2 pi over t is omega, so it's omega times r. Okay, so what we see here is that the speed for these two objects is proportional to r, but the omegas are the same. Okay, so constant angular velocity. Velocity is proportional to the radius. So omega is the same, v is different at different radii. Okay, so let's go over an example of a situation in which every point has the same angular velocity, and that's a good example of that is just something that's spinning at a constant rate. A turntable, a CD, something like that. Not sure CD actually does spin at a constant rate. Anyway, let's say it is. So the animation shows two balls on a turntable, and it turns out that both the speed and the acceleration are proportional to radius. So how does that work? So we know that our centripetal acceleration equation says acceleration is v squared over r. Okay, so one might naively think that if you double the radius, you would have the centripetal acceleration. Well, it turns out not to be the case. In fact, you're doubling the centripetal acceleration. Well, how does that work? Well, that's because, of course, V depends on R as well. Okay, so it's kind of a hidden R dependence inside the V. So we're going to make that R dependence explicit. So V is omega times R. And the reason we're switching from V to omega is they have different Vs, but they have the same omega. Okay? So if we replace v squared by omega squared r squared, or omega r all squared, in other words, then we can see that the acceleration is proportional to r. Omega is the same for both these objects, and r is different, of course. So the bigger the r, the bigger the centripetal acceleration. They're proportional to each other. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, here's another scenario. In this case, we keep the speed the same. The r's, again, are different by a factor of 2. Okay, so what happens here is it takes uh, half the time for that red object to go around once compared to the green object because it's going half the distance. The speeds are the same. So it turns out here that the acceleration is larger for the inner object. It was larger for the outer object in the previous case we looked at. Well, why is that? Well, in this case, we can just stick with v squared over r because they have the same v. So you double the r, you have the acceleration. Okay, so that's, in some sense, a simpler case than we looked at before. <clears throat> now we'll take two objects where the r is the same and the v's differ by a factor of two. So 
Once again, the red object takes half the time to go around as the green object does. They're covering the same distance, but the red object is moving twice as fast. Okay, so how do the accelerations compare? So in this case, again, we can just look at v squared over r. So the red object's acceleration happens to be, turns out to be, four times larger than that of the green object. Again, you can see from v squared over r, the r's are the same. The v's differ by a factor of two, so when you square that factor of two in the v, you get a factor of four. Okay, and end experience is twice the change in velocity in half the time. There's another way to see that it's a factor of four. Okay, so finally we're going to go over a general method for solving circular motion problems. And all we do is we follow the same method we used for any problem involving forces. So, what do we do for force problems? We drew a diagram of the situation. We picked an object and we drew a free body diagram of it. And if there was more than one object, we might draw a free body diagram for all the objects. And in each case, we show all forces acting on the objects. We choose a convenient coordinate system. So this is all the same as our general force problem analysis method, such as block on an inclined plane, accelerating down the plane. How do you find the acceleration? You get it from sum of all the forces equals ma. Okay. Again, it's most convenient to align one of your coordinate axes with the direction of the acceleration. Remember, so this is a little bit tricky for uh, circular motion, is that the acceleration steadily changes direction. It's always pointing toward the center. Okay, so But you just pick a point in time. You say, okay, at this point in time, the acceleration is in toward the center. I'm going to set up my coordinate system based on that picture. Okay, so you break the force up in x and y components. You apply Newton's second law in off in two different directions. And so nothing is new about this method for circular motion compared to just straight force problem. And this is the only thing we do differently is in uniform circular motion, A, the acceleration, has this special form. So when we write down the equation, sum of all the forces equals MA, then we take it one step further, we say, sum of all the forces equals mv squared over r. Okay, but that's the only thing we do new for circular motion that we didn't do for just general force problems. Okay, so that is all for our introduction to uniform circular motion.